I said this to a class um, on, in Kamehameha on, on Keao about a year ago, and I said, if you close your eyes for a second and you envision the Hawaiian archipelago, not just the eight major islands, but the entire Hawaiian archipelago, then also consider the 12-mile territorial sea. Then consider the 200-mile economic zone. And then consider the minerals below and the sky above. All of that was on the sovereign dominion of the Hawaiian kingdom. With that independence, that control remains with the Hawaiian kingdom and its Hawaiian national citizens. Under this process that they call Na'iau Puni, based on the policy statements of the United States anyway, and I did present another policy statement that was presented by the United States in 2013, essentially again affirming their position that self-determination can never lead to independence. And self-determination can never lead to sovereignty over the entire land base or the natural resources. That policy by the United States runs contrary to what the Hawaiian Kingdom has control over. So something for your consideration. Should you choose to participate in Na'i Puni, and let me just give you my opinion since I happen to be up here, my opinion is that you don't participate in Na'i Puni because it is contrary to our status as Hawaiian nationals on the Hawaiian Kingdom. It is contrary to, a, to a, the Hawaiian Kingdom status as a continuing nation state co-equal to other independent nations. But should you choose to participate in Na'i Puni, I ask that you at least consider the fact that based on U.S. policy, repeated U.S. policy, it cannot lead to independence. It cannot lead to permanent sovereignty over your natural resources. So for those uh, who support Na'iya Puni, and, and I don't know, and some of them have said it could lead to independence, I will tell you that's contrary to U.S. policy. Keanu Sai's memorandum to the OHA, uh, that was, um, he was, again, hired by OHA to provide that memorandum. One of the uh, recommendations was, was that the CEO in OHA refrain from funding or actually participate in this Na'iya Puni until we have further education on the issue. And, and I might suggest, in fact, we all know that this Na'iya Puni has been a rush to injustice. There has been no chance to educate our community or continue to educate our community about what our status is, who we are as a people. We are asking members who participate in Na'iya Puni to come up or draft a constitution, an organic document, when we know, and ladies and gentlemen, I don't mean to disparage anyone, but it's not a simple game to just get up there and write something down and say that's your constitution. I, I would submit that it takes some time and some education itself in learning how to do that, yes? Um, and so this whole call for a refrain to stop, to pause, um, I think is a reasonable recommendation. Um, I think it's a reasonable step and, I, and that's one of the reasons why I say re disenroll. Don't participate in the process. Tell them as a people, we need more information before we can make informed decisions. And we need more of our people to get this information. Let them make this informed decision. They don't have all the information. I don't understand why, well, actually I do understand why there's this rush. Because it's, as Andre said, it's not self-determination. It's a planned process. And it's a planned process towards federal recognition to turn us into a native tribe under U.S. dominion. Okay. That again runs contrary to who we are, who we were, and who we continue to be, Hawaiian nationals with the Hawaiian kingdom. So first of all, let's look at Na'iau Puni. What does Na'iau Puni mean? Is that a name, that, is that a, a, a name that's familiar to people? Anybody familiar with that? Does it sound familiar, Na'iau Puni? Who can tell me uh, what, what ali'i that would be connected to? Kamehameha. Now, how many of us think that it's in Kamehameha's vision to have the kingdom that he consolidated, given off away freely, wrongfully, to America? I would argue that Na'iau Puni goes against every single thing that 
Na'i Alpuni or Ka Na'i Alpuni actually did. So on, in, in, in its name itself, it already, it, we already see inconsistencies with, with what Na'i Alpuni actually means. To Na'i, to conquer, to conquer the kingdom. What I see Na'i Alpuni as is an attempt for someone else to conquer our kingdom. So maybe for those on the other side, they can call it Na'i Alpuni. Yeah, uh, where's Uncle Uncle Earl's not here? Uh, <laughs> I cannot say it without giving him credit for it. Um, but yeah, Uncle Earl calls it Ma'i Alpuni. <laughs> and I actually cannot think of a better... That's what they should have called it. Just add a one more line to the end and call it Ma'i Alpuni. Because it's a sickness. It really is a sickness, I believe. And, and it goes against everything that we have achieved, albeit little, little steps, but it goes against everything. And it, I think it, it's an attempt to negate everything that we have achieved as a people over the last year, over the last two years, over the last 10 years, over the last 20 and 30 years. You know, Kalekoa would always say, if that's the best they get, we already got them beat. And I think that they know that to be true. I think they see that. I think they see that over the last 30 years, Hawaiians have gotten educated. And we've been educated in truth. Um, and, and, that, and that information is coming out. And Hawaiians are speaking their language. And that in itself is a, is a huge revelation. It's a huge, it's a huge holomua. Because a Hawaiian language speaker versus an English language speaker is going to have a different perspective. Just like an English, uh, English speaker versus a German speaker versus a Russian speaker versus a Chinese speaker versus a Mexican speaker. It's, gonna, it's a different. The language really, the language is the, is the, the ka'a is, is that, that rope that would hold the fishing line and the fishing hook together. Yeah, in, in the traditional ways of fishing. The ka'a is what binded that line and the hook so that it wouldn't separate when you catch your fish. And, and that's what the language is, I think, of our culture. It's what binds it all together. I don't, I don't know if, if federal recognition is, is even better than what we have right now. And so it's a, it's a, it's a compromise, and, and it's about Na'iyao Puni, federal recognition. It's about asking our master for a larger cage, maybe. Asking our master, can, can you clean it? Can I, have, you know, can I have dessert tonight? And so it's about asking for just bits and crumbs of what we know we had, still have, it's just not recognized. And so I know that, you know, I think Keanu would argue, maybe, maybe some people here would argue too, that legally, lawfully, it doesn't do nothing because it's illegal to begin with and we don't have to worry about that. And, and that may be true, but what I worry about is not what's happening on the papers. Now what's happening in the offices? I worry about what's happening up here. Because we already have 122 years of lies, manipulation, and brainwash to erase and to forget. And so the more that we add on to that, every day that goes by, there's more and more and more to erase and to forget and to relearn. And so that's, that's where I see the, the, the biggest detriment of this. It's, it's, a, it's a further, like the flyer said, confusing. It's a confusion, but it's, 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 um, it's purposeful. Yeah, they're not, it's not like to say, oh, let's do this and, and maybe people will get confused. That's not the way I look at it. I think it's, let's confuse the people. Because they see, you know, so we look at overthrow three years later, 1896, what I consider to be the beginning of institutionalized denationalization in Hawaii when they ban Hawaiian language in all of the schools. And so over time, we've been taught a history, truly, that really doesn't exist. That's false. It's a revisionist history, um, and we and we've been taught to, or we've been tried to be taught to be proud of someone and something that we are not. And so, but it has worked for a lot of our people. It's confused us, and that's why we're in this state. That's why we're talking about these things. If we weren't confused, then we wouldn't need to have these discussions. We all know it's heva. We're gonna just leave it on the side, and we're gonna do it on our own. We just need to stay the course, but we need to do it together. DOI came last year. It blew them out, the, out of the waters, but we can't testify for independence. We can't vote for independence. I don't, I don't think that's the answer. I think the only way that we can achieve independence is to struggle for it and to take it ourselves. And so Mauna Kea gives us an opportunity to do that right now, but it's not the end. We know there's many, many other issues that may arise before that's done. So we may be fighting multiple battles at a time, but that's the way that we will achieve what we're out to achieve. That's the way where we will have 
uh, return back to us what is rightfully ours. We can't wait for the DUI to come back and, and try, write, try write a nice speech. Um, because we've seen that they're only going to listen to what they want to listen to, they're going to use what they want to use, and they're going to discard what they want to discard. So the answer is, the chief of the chief because of the people. So it's up to the people to, to get it done. Um, testify, participate, all that kind of stuff may kai, but that's not the answer. Uh, the answer will come to us struggling together, supporting each other in those times of struggle, and in the end, uh, winning together. If, if you think about the fundamental assumption, where did this idea of dependency come from? Where did we come from the point where we were on an island and we could survive and we were sustainable to we cannot survive today? And the answer to that question is the fundamental thing that Ho'okahi was talking about, that I'm talking about, that we need to break. Yeah, this umbilical cord that says we cannot survive without you. Yeah, that colonial mentality that I have to be connected to you. Hawaii had electri the Iolani Palace had electricity before the White House and Buckingham Palace. We were so backwards, we had that stuff before them. We had an opera house in the 1880s. Do we have that today? No. I think culture and all of these things have actually downgraded under the United States, not upgraded. I think we're a little more backwards now than we were then. And you can also, if you want to go to the Jones Act and how all of our foreign goods have to go to LA and then come back to Hawaii and we eat all of that shipping costs, if you want to look at all of the infrastructure for all of the uh, the cabling that comes through Hawaii, and Hawaii is the hub for telecommunications, underground cabling, and fiber optics, I think we'll be okay. Just a quick thing too, and I'm not really looking at, at income and stuff like that, but sustainability and food. And, and look when, you know what I mean, traditionally when Captain Cook came, which we all know, I mean, we have a, a long history before that, but when he came, he just was stripping out. Couldn't believe how, how clean and productive our lands were. And so again, that tells you what they were used to. Yeah, they only couldn't believe it because they never seen stuff like that before. If you've seen it before, you, it's easy to believe. So they were tripping out because they weren't used to that. And just another quick thing. We know that, you know, fish ponds, loi, valleys, dry land, all over. I mean, there's no issues with, with food and, and feeding ourselves and and being able to, to deport that. So white people alone, white people valley, in times of famine, back in the, in the traditional times, white people valley alone could feed Hawaii Island and parts of Maui during times of famine. Just one valley, just one valley. So that's just another thing that, that we would have, our government, I believe, would have better land management, better natural resource management, and, and that in itself being able to feed ourselves and not having to eat all of these costs and bring things in, I think that that would affect that a lot. For Hawaiian people defined by federal recognition, legal history, mo'olelo, does not matter. And this is from the proposed rulemaking thing uh, of the DOI, and I have highlighted the important part. By enacting more than 150 federal statutes over the last century, that is the definition that creates us as a people in the eyes of the Department of the Interior's process. So not history, not as Noi Gunter Kaup was said in the last hour's discussion, not sort of the historical relationship that the kingdom had with the United States, you know, that went all the way back to the 1790s, but we're just talking about 150 budgetary federal statutes over the last century. That's the requirement that the DOI is asking Hawaiians to, it's already fulfilled, so we exist. Um, and, and this is what they would do. The proposed rule involves a multi step process. We know about this uh, from the Nanyakuni Constitutional Convention. Government defined by the U.S. Since the U.S. through the Department of the Interior has signaled that Hawaii provide a challenge to the standard federal recognition process, I suggest we should not allow ourselves to be defined to the standard channels which the U.S. has created for Native American tribes. Instead, we should outline another process 
that insists that our legal relationship with the United States be defined by the vast historical record and legal precedent grounded in language and sources, sort of more like flowery, less like tribes, because these questions do not fall under the DOI proposed ruling. If you read through the 70 pages quite clearly, it says, if you want to talk about independence, if you want to talk about any other model than the one we're proposing, please don't stop here and tell us about your problems. Answer only the questions we ask you to answer. And that's the problem with the process. We cannot seek such a reconfiguration of legal relations with the US through this arm, the DOI of the government. A federally recognized Hawaiian government or governing entity will not be allowed to seek any legal redress against the state of Hawaii. Land claims? I'm going to say probably forget them. The native Hawaiian government will have the power to negotiate with the United States and state. A settlement in perpetuity is the goal. For our historian, this looks like history foreclosed. History almost as autopsy. Um, unlike the Tongan case, 2010, where they did constitutional reform, Hawaiians will not pursue constitutional reform led by experts in Tongan constitutionalism, history, language, or culture. Those elected to Na'iyalapuni will receive a crash course on how to write a constitution over 10 days, led by the legal experts I have been talking about. None of whom read or speak Hawaiian. Unlike our Maori cousins, who will not pursue claims against, in their face, the crown, the United States, by empowering experts in treaties and constitutions, history, law, or Waina, tradition, the Hawaiian way of doing things. One way to reframe our thinking is in terms of our historical trajectory. Are we Pacific or are we American? Should we be thinking in comparative legal system frames? Comparative legal system frames. If you, if you need to look at how that works in other places, look at common constitutionalism reform, look at the papers written on that, the studies, look at the Treaty of Waitangi and the tribunal. It's not perfect. Hawaiian use, or only US and only through the DOI, which is the option currently being um, made available. Uh, the federal fed rep solution. Every federally recognized tribe in the US had to prove that they have an unbroken chain of governance since the settlement of their territories. We talked about this in the last hour. Some tribes, it takes 60 years to go through the federal recognition process. That's because they have to gather all the documents all of the history, all of the anything that proves that they have a government that's intact, even while colonial settlement, even while removal, all of those things that whatever happened in their area of the nation, they have to prove that. Hawaiian standard is we got 150 budgetary sort of uh, uh, things approved and that makes us a, a, a nation. Every tribe has to do historical language and cultural work to make land claims to illustrate the extent of their tribal territory. A native Hawaiian government granted federal recognition under the terms laid out is made real because of the budget appropriations listed in that DOI um, thing that have included Hawaiians and through the Hawaiian Homestead Act. This is the version of history that the federal government wants to acknowledge. A strong faction of the people who are engineering this process aims to persuade the elite trusts to dissolve their holdings and turn them over to the native Hawaiian government entity. And again, I have all these notes here, it's really difficult to read, but um, I think there's a lot of fear on where you can look at the of federal recognition that a native Hawaiian government entity is needed to protect the elite trusts. But none of the legal experts, political pundits, or those who aspire to political office have produced any legal assessment of the status quo. What the probability of any risks would be from where it would arise? nor have any of the trustees from any of these elite trusts come forward in public to argue that this statement is the truth, that they themselves feel besieged. None of the trusts have come out to publicly endorse the Nutnyalpuni process, even though the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Mo'o'alpuni website, that's the word they created, it means history of governance, I think. Um, Includes the other yeah, trust as one arm of that that page. So
American passports. <laughs> Do you want to say some words before? Um, burn the ballot. <laughs> burn this, Saka. Not vote. Burn this ballot. Colonialism is a form of colonialism that is not just about the event, but about the structures that continue to put in place subjugation of indigenous politics and social work. Now, why I think this analytic one is especially important in the Native Hawaiian context is because the politics of recognition or becoming part of the Department of Interior is very much one of those structures of settler colonialism that is put into place. Um, it relies, and this becomes important too, it relies not just on dominant structures to subjugate us, but also a logic of eliminating the natives, not merely as individuals, but as people. So there's just two important things to remember here. Reservations are created from federal actions. They are intended for the use and occupation, right? This is the language. I don't know what language is going to, uh, I'm not an expert, and I'm not here to present on the uh, Hawaiian issues. But that idea of use and occupation of Indian peoples um, becomes impor important to really pay careful attention to in whatever comes out of your legal documents. Um, but they're usually held in trust by the federal government. So there's been a lot of issues with this. There's been corruption. There's been lack of documentation. Uh, I hope some of you have heard about the Eloise Cobell settlement, which, yeah? That get dispersed. People don't even know how it's getting dispersed. Some people get two dollars. Some people get two thousand dollars. They can't really figure it out. The record keeping was horrible. It took them years to even get that money reimbursed. But that was because um, because the Bureau of Indian Affairs was undermining the amount of money that nations would get from the resources that were being extracted from them. In the meantime. When the BIA sold the rights to mining companies and, it, uh, and other CEO companies that made a lot of money, right? Um, corporate companies that made a lot of money, um, the, the American Indian people were left with the environmental destruction that that took place. Whether that be strip mining, whether that be uranium mining and high cancer rates in the Luna Pueblo, or the inability and poor air quality that takes place at the Navajo Nation Reservation, or any of these sort of things, the death rate of American Indians is a lot higher than that otherwise. So that's what having your land held in trust by the US government means. Right now, as we speak, Canada is dumping uh, untreated wastewater into the St. Lawrence Seaway for, uh, in front of the um, Aquasauce. I wanted to acknowledge that as well. 15 billion gallons of raw sewage in a waterway, this is what it means, right near the reservation. And uh, so there's, there's a particular way that th these issues, that land being held in trust, waterways also not being considered in, in some instances, have really had a deep, deep effect on the environments we live in and the land we live on. Um, so what we see here is settler colonialism and the logics of elimination. And there's a particular way that this has, this, this has continued as well. But I just wanted to point out the fact, I come from a federally recognized tribe. Uh, we're not part of the Seneca, Seneca Nation, we're separate. But there's a particular way in 1960s, the US government uh, claimed eminent domain, and they flooded uh, and removed 600 families from the corn planter reservation and ancestral lands. Um, and this was done by the Army of Corps Engineer. And they very, you look at those maps, and they very much made this happen because it was reservation land. So federal recognition actually doesn't help you protect that flooding and damming. 
Fort Berthold, uh, which are home of the uh, home of several different groups, Mandan Hadatsa and Little Shell. Uh, they also faced flooding in the 19, as late as the 1960s and theft of their land as well. So I'm just raising these issues to say here because what what becomes primary here is, uh, and I'll just quote this uh, by Patrick Wolf, is that whatever settlers may say, and they generally have a lot to say, the primary motive for elimination is not race or religion, ethnicity, blah, 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 a grade of civilization, etc., but access to territory. Territoriality is settler colonialism's specific and irreducible element. And I really believe that that um, becomes part of the case. So I'm just going to go to the, the base roles here, because there's a big link between base roles and land, and also people's bodies, and how they get quantified in particular ways. That's uh, what is part and parcel of the conundrum of uh, the conundrum of blood quantum here. And this is a, a slide that I that I use to say. And I just also wanted to say that some people try to resist this blood ideology this, that's imported from Europeans, Sanguilinga, that's uh, reported from Europeans, right? Mostly in um, try to avoid this by having either patrilineal descent or matrilineal descent. But the U.S. demands in this recognition process, it demands absolute like, notions of purity at its finest. And so therefore, you don't have the flexibility that you thought you might have in, in you know, creating family in the way that you want to create family. So that's just something I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, this is a BIA card that gives you access to IHS or dental services, etc. But this becomes also uh, also different than what it means to be a citizen or what it means to be a member. A lot of tribes right now are really wrestling with that question, right? Because they don't have they, they don't have high level on their seat. They're they're the increasing 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 like in the last side of the memberships. And who can vote, who can act as a community. And so that consistent dwindling has caused people to reform their constitutions and try to move towards more traditional constitutions that consider membership in a more fluid way. Barker says, blood degree measures the purity of genealogical descent, and so the legal legitimacy of membership rights, but it also serves as a mechanism for a certain kind of racialization that is about making Native peoples the colonial imperial, or the colonized imperialized. And so I think this is important to think about. What the 1934 uh, Self-Determination Act did is they used these templates for governance that would, and uh, Randy has one on the computer that we can pull up if you want to see it, but it pretty much had the same format. Define your territorial jurisdiction, define your membership, fill in the blank, right? This is for tribes that had sophisticated forms of governance. Like we have the, the great law, and they give you a template, and it went all around, and you know, then you're stuck with it. And to get it reformed has been incredibly difficult. Uh, if you want to see what some a constitution, I know they're supposed to hand out constitutions or something for you to look at, but the White Earth Constitution is the first one that actually tries to have uh, traditional Anishinaabe notions involved in it, and uh, thinking about being more flexible. But that becomes. Be partly because uh, these base roles and the way that they want the tribal councils to operate is about population management. So everybody got the same homogenized federal recognition because they, Indians were hard to manage, right? The reason that it went from the War Department and we got into, into the, to the Secretary of Interior and then we went through an assimilation period was because they found it easier and less expensive to assimilate us than it would be to kill us. And that's the reality. And, and um, they actually calculated the cost of what would be most expensive for more expensive. I feel like the U.S. has instituted in each one of these, whether it was through boarding school policies, through self-determination policies, through accepting of private property, right, turning land into property, which are two different things. Land is something you take care of that takes care of you. Right? Property is something you own and control and can transfer easily. Um, I think through all this, there's been ideas of progress, 
right? And so I, I heard, I've heard it a lot in the last two days I've been here. I don't know how much you guys have heard it, but this is the idea of let's make progress. But I would be wary of that for, the, for uh, <laughs> Joanne's uh, words here as well. So I just want us to think, here's a picture of my grandmother. She was a tough woman. Um, and I, I kind of end with her as, as well because I think about... I think about uh, my family and the way they always taught me to defy or the politics of refusal of the U.S. government to always hold them in check. We're not one nation under God, for instance, we're several nations and our treaties must be recognized and they must recognize that, right? This becomes part of how we're taught to hold ourselves and, our, and hold our nations with respect. Like in, in our, in our, and I respect that long, those long generations who have really held together traditional knowledges and new knowledges and have made new knowledges in order to protect us as a community ongoing, even despite the constant elimination of us as well. And as we go, go forward, I think, I, I was thinking about this today, usually I talk about this in relation to women's, uh, women in relation to um, tribal governance and other forms of governance, uh, and, and just redefining feminism. But in Seneca law, it was a matter of course for women to hold power in a stick toward maintaining their own laws and nationhood threatened by European settlers. Men were not in a position to grant power, just as the government is not in a position to grant sovereignty. Economic data that exists for American Indian tribes. Uh, this is what preservations look like. Sort of in the U.S., all the numbers are reservations across. These are the 300 some odd that are located here. There are a few hundred in Alaska. You see the biggest ones by geography are in the Dakotas and the American Southwest. California has hundreds of tribes. Some of the questions that we should be asking ourselves: What are the sources of uh, revenues for tribal governments? There are gaming revenues um, that come from from casino operations. That's one huge source, and it's an incredibly big source these days. There are tribes that actually do their own uh, provision of, of education, health, uh, and, and housing programs where they contract with the U.S. federal government. Uh, they, they extract natural resources, they manage their own land, uh, but sometimes the U.S. federal government does and does not give them all the, the actual that is due to them. Some have small businesses, but that's very small, and some have treaties. So some of the funding is from historical treaties, but again, as Michonne has said, it uh, doesn't actually sort of play out very well. And there are very little taxations of government uh, on tribal reservations, so that does not form the basis of their revenues. It really is from these other options. And so again, if forming a native Hawaiian, federally recognized, or any other sort of government, one should be considering these things. Where does the revenues, where will they come from? Uh, and, in, and in writing a constitution, there are a whole bunch of things that need to be thought about that haven't been thought about currently. What the legal jurisdiction will be, what the political institution will be, what are the resource endowments, and membership, as everyone has been talking about. Noe talked about it, and Shauna talked about it. I will skip over some of this because we don't have time. One thing that really matters is that the political institutions themselves that are created uh, have an effect on the long-term sustainability and success of the, the uh, underlying tribal uh, governments. Cornell and Colt have looked at the match, and this is what uh, Michonne was talking about a little while ago, the cultural match of the tribe with the existing political institutions. When they didn't match, there was a huge level of, there was a low level of economic development. But when they matched one another, uh, just by chance, it turned out, they had good levels of economic development. And why didn't they match? Well, because the U.S. federal government dictated the kind of institution, political institution, that they would have. Um, and I've done some work with some colleagues that looked at 70 American Indian tribes, and we looked at their constitutions uh, when they started, and we looked at the different types of political institutions that they had, and what we found, ultimately, is that less concentrated power at the outset made <laughs> made uh, uh, increased economic development over time. So some of the things to take away from this, as Professor Reeser was talking about earlier, we have a lot of history of our own to look at, but we also have history uh, across, uh, across American Indian reservations where they have experienced um, political and governance uh, self-determination, as well as across the Pacific, I'm not even talking about the Pacific here. 
So again, we know the obstacles for native Hawaiians. There's just the geograph geographic distribution and our size. We don't know what our outcomes are. We don't know what the consensus is for native Hawaiians. We're rushing this process. We haven't asked each other, what are our priorities? Is it housing? Is it employment? Is it healthcare? Is it education? Is it natural resource protection? I don't know. And no one here in this room, or in the state, or anywhere on the planet knows, because no one has asked Hawaiians. Instead, we said, let's just run ahead and do this. So we, none of us know what our priorities are. Uh, the definitions of citizenship and enrollment, again, how will that be, be defined? Uh, and this is where Hawaiians live, outside of Hawaii. Texas is a big place, California, there's 74,000. So again, looking at these numbers, you should be sort of uh, affected by them and realize that the size of this, uh, the population in a place like Virginia, North Carolina is 4,000. That's double the size of the average uh, population size on a reservation. Right? We have a very, very complicated, complex geographic distribution for us. In Hawaii alone, let alone outside of Hawaii. So, I will just end with this idea that what are the options other than federal recognition? Well, we could stay where we're at now and figure out ways to survive. We could think about corporations, that's what the Alaska Natives do. We could think about independent nation state, that's what FSM has done, Palau back to the kingdom, which is Tonga. Um, but we don't know any of the pros and cons of this because we haven't discussed it as a people, as a group in public. And so I'll end with that. Aloha, we need to keep Hawaiian lands in Hawaiian hands. We need to oppose the DOI rules because the DOI rules say that Lands that are currently held by the federal government, over 800,000 of acres of federal lands and over 8 million acres of um, the rest of the Hawaiian archipelago is not under, is not going to be included with this discussion. So go on to protestnaiaopuni.com and submit your testimony online and oppose the DOI rules. comes out that Maggie and I co-authored about the creation, he called it manufacturing consent. And I, this is what I'm talking about, the even amnesia about recent events is typical of this process, that the Royal Commission was given how many millions of dollars for two years to hit their target of enrolling 200,000 Hawaiians, and we can't even get a straight number of how many people they enrolled under Kana'i Oluwalu. So the numbers in the media run from 9,000 to as low as 9,000 to as high as 40,000. They've never been transparent about how many people they were able to enroll. It necessitated the legislature and an act to sweep the names off of three other roles. The youngest of those roles is 10 years old. Only one of those lists had anything to do with governance. The other two were sort of, well, I think, you know, I'm Hawaiian and I want a card that says, I can go like apply for a scholarship someplace and I don't have to keep re-showing my papers because that's a bother. So those other two lists were about sort of identifying Hawaiians and you know putting them on some kind of role to make them able to get you know applications for scholarship. We don't even know how many people were on either of those three roles. Many Hawaiians are on the list. They don't know how they got on the list. They don't know which list their name came from. I'm on the list. I still haven't received a ballot. There's no number anywhere that allows me to call them and ask them, "Hey, my ballot didn't come." You know, so. If you're asking, are they going to jack numbers to fit some kind of flexible, you know, slippery number, are we even going to get numbers from who voted? When we can't even get a number about the manner in which the electorate was formed, the role commission was created by government, of, governor appointment. We have role commissioners, the role commission is still on. We have role commissioners running as candidates. Unfree, undemocratic election? No bother, it's a private election. 
It's run by a group, Elections America, that does sort of alumni elections, uh, credit union elections. So they, they, they don't run government elections. So we have ballots for the mainland candidates that have reproduced names of people running for candidacy in multiple. In any other state of the nation, that, that ballot would be disqualified. But we have no oversight on the process. And the problem that is facing us is there is no outlet for the majority of Hawaiians who are not on that electorate list. We don't even know how many are on there. To say, I don't like this process. Nobody's giving us $2.6 million to create educational programs for our communities. No one's giving us money to form these community, you know, in our key puka. Because there are people who, who reign sovereign in their own territory because that ohana mama was that koa, that kalo yuka. We have examples of governance everywhere in our communities. This process just is not going to acknowledge that. It's going to be what like Sean described, one size fits all, sovereignty. So the question is not that we're not doing nothing, it's just that, is the something being done now something good? That should be a standard. And we need people who are not Hawaiian to start asking these questions about the unfree, undemocratic nature of this process. And I'll just say one last thing on that too, that you, <clears throat> I think the answer is absolutely, they'll probably change the rules because we have it in American Indian history that that's happened all the time. In the 1930s, when the tribes were getting the boilerplate constitutions, with, with populations of 300, 120 people would vote in favor, and the US federal, the rest would not even show up because they opposed. So there wasn't even a no vote. It was 120 in favor. The US federal government counts that as approved. We're taking hundreds of examples of that in the 1930s. So do I expect that to happen? Probably. So we know what the outcome is going to be. So your answer is yeah. One of the one of the things that and I was told and I, I want to share this info. This is this a lot of this info comes directly from high level officials within OHA and within the legislature that I've talked to and who have shared info with me. So I'm not making this up. I'm sharing with you things that OHA people have told me at, at the management levels and others. Um, the state of the the those that supported federal recognition realized that they weren't going to get it. But they also realized some years ago, OHA came to a conclusion, a legal position. In the past, Office of Hawaiian Affairs has attempted to enter into settlements. Many of us remember the different settlements. Um, it was big, hot issues. Rowena Akana tried to sneak one through when she was a chair. Um, Apoleona got busted, tried to sneak one through back in 2009. Over here, this side. Um, um, and these settlements were never with our consent or involvement. Um, and the big one that we need to be concerned about is the global settlement. Yeah, that's the, and maybe Lehua can tell us more about that, but the global settlement will include land, land claims. It could include claims that as a result of the overthrow, it could be just a one-time big settlement pow, yeah? We'll give you something, case closed. So that's the potential. So what happened was Office of Hawaiian Affairs, this is what I was told, what real, came to a legal position that they cannot do a global settlement because they represent the state's interests, right? So it's convoluted with their being a state agency and so, supposed to represent Hawaiians. There's a conflict, so they cannot do a global settlement, and they realize that. And so because of that legal position, now they know they need something else to, to do, to enter into the settlement agreement. So by creating a Hawaiian governing entity, even if it only has state-level recognition, that Hawaiian entity would have a strong potential to enter into a global settlement. And again, um, 
that would, if we see how the politics play out, a lot of that would be done without our involvement, without our consent, yeah? So that's one of the things that I was told to pay attention to. Federal recognition is like a Hail Mary. If it happens, it happens. But if it doesn't, this is what they're really looking at, the global settlement, because a global settlement would be land, probably, and monies, and it would um, already be consolidated into this governing Hawaiian entity, right? If you listen to um, the director of governance for Office of Hawaiian Affairs right now, he's been saying that his job has been to, cons to prepare assets for transfer over to the entity. That means they would transfer hazard time. Oh, no, I gave my, my clock. Um, I'm going to wrap up in about 10 minutes. But that means they would consolidate OHA monies, OHA lands. We're talking Waukele Opuna, 4,000 acres of uh, pristine forest. We're talking Waimea Valley. Um, you know, a lot of wealth would be consolidated into some kind of almost private corporate entity. And whoever controls that entity would be very powerful in Hawaii and wealthy. Um, so this is what I was um, alerted of. So we got to pay attention not only to federal recognition, but the potential for a global settlement later. Homia, dirty, dirty the waters. Go drink from the dirty waters. So what what is a uh, Naya Puni in a bigger context? So in the uh, the. The larger context, when federal recognition is sought by the American Indian tribes or other indigenous people in the United States, Alaska Native, generally the, uh, the, the process starts from the ground up, not from the top down. Normally, the state, the governor of the state does not lead the process. Normally, it's the community that comes together and seeks the federal recognition. Nanya Okuni and Kanani Oluwalu started in the exact opposite direction. It started from the governor. It started from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, state agencies, state agents, uh, employees there, and then came to the Department of Interior uh, to lobby on behalf of Native Hawaiians. Uh, so this is completely backwards of the standard process and calls into question the legitimacy and the, uh, the authenticity of this process. When the state is looking to do this, one has to start becoming suspicious of what the ulterior motives are. We don't know explicitly what they are, but we can, you know, try to infer what they might be, such as land claim settlement, uh, you know, uh, sort of distinguishing, you know, potential claims of, for independence. But again, it's not clear. But nevertheless, it is suspect that the governor uh, and the state legislature and the Office of Foreign Affairs are the funders of this process. A true process would start from the ground up. If the Office of Hawaiian Affairs wanted to really help this process, they would find ways to distribute those funds that they've been using to lobby Congress to federally, uh, to state recognized Native Hawaiians via Kanani uh, Oluwole, and get those funds to community groups to organize, to gather consensus amongst Native Hawaiians so that those thoughts and those ideas could come from an organic process from the community, as opposed to trying to have delegates seek and create a constitution in 40 days out of thin air. There's nothing it's based on. Uh, constitutions have to come from the people. It has to embody the principles, the beliefs, the values of the community that will, it will govern. There's no way this process can do that. And that's that's the problem with Mario. And, and what are some alternatives that, that you can, that you've seen? I mean, People have been living for thousands of years. I guess. <laughs> People have been yeah. living for thousands of years. And uh, for, for Native Hawaiians, we are in the process of educating ourselves. We have just learned the last you know, 15, 20 years about the Pu'e petitions. We're just understanding the fact that there is no treaty of annexation. We are learning tremendous amounts about the Native Hawaiian uh, people ourselves, as well as the Hawaiian Kingdom. Uh, there's a whole uh, repository of archives of debates that went on when constitutions were being created here in Hawaii by Native Hawaiians in the Native Hawaiian language. The thoughts, the ideas, the, uh, the, the debates that happened, we haven't even scratched that. We don't understand what happened. We don't understand in the Hawaiian language what the thoughts and, and uh, activities were. 
neither do we understand the examples and experiences that happen across the United States and indigenous communities, as well as the Pacific. So there's so much we don't understand. And, and the other argument would be that, well, we can't wait around forever. And that's absolutely true. Uh, we don't live forever. But the problem is creating something that's uh, faulty is worse than probably the status quo. And that's our problem, is that creating something that's half-baked will not serve to solve the problems that we know exist in Hawaii for Native Hawaiians or anyone else. So if we can get at least some semblance of agreement on what we want to solve and what is our biggest problem, uh, at least we can work towards that in a rational manner as opposed to this haphazard uh, manner in which it's sort of being undertaken by the state of Hawaii currently. That is the main problem. So I think the solution is education and more discussion at the community level about all the sort of the, the entire spectrum of opportunities and possibilities. Oh,